Welcome to Dermatology Explained. Today we are continuing our video series on cutaneous T-cell lymphomas. Today's video topic is focused on primary cutaneous CD30 plus lymphoproliferative disorders. So just to recap our algorithm when considering cutaneous T-cell lymphomas, we generally categorize them into three broad groups. The first group comprises mycosis, fungoides, and cesare syndrome, which makes up 65% of all cutaneous T-cell lymphomas. The next group, which is the focus of today's presentation, is the spectrum of cutaneous CD30 plus lymphoproliferative disorders. And this comprises lymphomatoid papillosis, as well as cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma. And then there's the third group of conditions, which include adult T-cell lymphoma, subcutaneous paniculitis like T-cell lymphoma, extranodal NK and T-cell lymphoma, aggressive epidermotropic CD8 plus C-cell lymphoma, the gamma delta T-cell lymphoma, and various other rarer forms of T-cell lymphoma. And these will be discussed in future videos. So in terms of an overview, the CD30 plus lymphoproliferative disorders makes up the second largest group of cutaneous T-cell lymphomas, and there is no nodal or systemic involvement at diagnosis. It accounts for 25% of cutaneous T-cell lymphomas. LYP and CALCL can be considered to be on a spectrum. So cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma and lymphomatoid papillosis have overlapping clinical, histological, and immunophenotypical features, which form a spectrum of disease. The histological criteria alone are often insufficient to distinguish between these two ends of the spectrum. The clinical appearance and course are often used as criteria for the diagnosis as well as the choice of treatment. There are some cases which are referred to as borderline cases. These refer to patients whom, despite careful clinico-pathological correlation, a definitive distinction between cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma and lymphomatoid papillosis cannot be made. In these cases, long-term clinical follow-up will generally help disclose whether the patient has one condition or the other. Primary cutaneous CD30 positive lymphoproliferative disorders should be differentiated from a number of other conditions which can mimic this. This includes skin involvement by systemic anaplastic large cell lymphoma, CD30 plus positive transforms of mycosis fungoides, other well-defined types of cutaneous T-cell lymphoma which may incidentally express the CD30 plus antigen, as well as reactive, often benign skin conditions with infiltrates that contain CD30 positive blast cells, including various viral infections, arthropod bite reactions, scabies, and atopic dermatitis. So before we proceed, I'd just like to touch upon what is the CD30. CD30 is a member of the tumor necrosis factor receptor, TNF, superfamily. It was first identified on re Sternberg cells identified in Hodgkin's lymphoma's lesions. CD30 is expressed on aberrant T and B lymphocytes in lymphoma and is a hallmark of lymphomatoid papillosis. However, it can also be present in a number of other conditions, including viral infections, germ cell tumors, as well as arthropod bites. CD30 density and pattern of arrangement can help differentiate between these diagnoses. Of interest to note is that CD30 is also the target of a rentuximab biologic which is used in some cases of Hodgkin's lymphoma, systemic anaplastic large cell lymphoma, as well as cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma. Let's focus now on lymphomatoid papillosis, or LYP. Lymphomatoid papillosis is defined as a chronic recurrent self-healing papillonocrotic or papillonodular skin disease, which has histological features suggestive of a CD30 plus malignant lymphoma. The initiating event in LYP is unknown. Several authors have suggested a potential viral etiology. However, this has not been proven. The mechanisms involved in the spontaneous disappearance and appearance of skin lesions observed in some patients with lymphomatoid papillosis have not been clearly established. However, it is suggested that the interaction between CD30 and its ligand may contribute to apoptosis of some neoplastic T-cells and thus resulting in subsequent regression of skin lesions. In terms of the epidemiology, lymphomatoid papillosis accounts for approximately 15% of all cutaneous T-cell lymphomas. These can present at any age. The youngest patient reported to date was aged five months old and the oldest patient was aged 84 years of age. In a large case series, the average age of onset varied between 35 to 45 years, and the average age was 40 to 50 years. There is a slight male predominance with male to female ratio of 1.5 to 1. The incidence is 1.2 to 2 cases per million. Because of the overlapping clinical and histological features between lymphomatoid papillosis and cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma, such as the presence of an aberrant T-cell phenotype, clonally rearranged T-cell receptor genes in 60 to 70 percent of patients, as well as the presence of identical T-cell clones in lymphomatoid papillosis lesions as well as associated lymphoma lesions, lymphomatoid papillosis is best regarded as a low-grade variant of cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. 
It also has a number of associations to be aware of, including a 15 to 50% chance of secondary cutaneous lymphomas, mostly mycosis fungoides and primary cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma. In 5 to 10% of cases, there is a risk of Hodgkin's lymphoma, and there's also been reports of increased risk of squamous cell cancer, melanoma, lung cancer, and bladder cancer. In terms of the clinical features of lymphomatoid papulosis, these are characterized by red-brown papules and nodules that develop central hemorrhage, necrosis, and crusting. They appear and then subsequently disappear spontaneously within a number of weeks, typically between 3 to 12 weeks. Characteristically on examination, the skin lesions may be in different stages of evolution. The papular nodules may leave transient hypopigmented or hyperpigmented macules, and occasionally some superficial atrophic scars or varioliform scars may be left behind as the lesions disappear. In other cases, these lesions may disappear without any ulceration or sequelae. The predominant site of involvements include the trunk and limbs. The eruption is generally asymptomatic. It is important to note that the number of lesions and the severity of the associated symptoms do not predict the clinical course of lymphomatoid papulosis. This is important in terms of patient counseling, as all patients with lymphomatoid papulosis, regardless of the number and severity of lesions, should be informed about the potential association with other lymphomas. In terms of the workup, a 4 millimeter punch biopsy should be performed. It can be difficult to differentiate between lymphomatoid papulosis with cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma, and this requires clinical and histological correlation. Other workup tests include T-cell receptor gene rearrangement studies, blood testing including FBC, blood film, flow cytometry, LDH, electrolytes, liver function testing, and LDH, immunosuppressive screening, lymph node testing, examination for hepatosplenomegaly, as well as imaging such as PET scan or CT scan to exclude lymphomas. In terms of the histology of lymphomatoid papulosis, there is a significant variation. In part, it may correlate with the age of the sampled skin lesion. There have been several histological types of LYP described, with LYP type A being the most classic and most common form, making up over 75% of cases. However, there are other forms of LYP as well including type B, which is similar to mycosis fungoides, type C, which is most similar to cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma, type D, which is similar to aggressive epidermotropic CD8 plus cytotoxic T cell lymphoma, type E, which is predominantly perivascular and intraluminal, and type F, which is predominantly follicularly based. It is important to note that the different types of LYP may occur concurrently in different lesions in the same patient. The subtype does not have any treatment or prognostic implications. Here are some images demonstrating on the top half of the screen type A wedged shape histology of lymphomatoid papulosis, and the bottom half of the screen demonstrates a mycosis fungoides-like histological appearance of lymphomatoid papulosis. Here is an example of cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma-like lymphomatoid papulosis on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side, the more aggressive epidermotropic CD8 plus cytotoxic T cell lymphoma-like histological appearance. In terms of the differentials, small recurrent OIP lesions on the trunk are frequently misinterpreted as folliculitis or arthropod bites for many years. And notably, CD30 plus cells can be observed in many benign conditions. On the other hand, because of the presence of multifocal skin lesions with histological features of CD30 plus positive cutaneous T cell lymphoma, lymphomatoid papulosis patients are often regularly treated unnecessary, unnecessarily with multi agent chemotherapy, particularly in the case where the treating teams are not familiar with this specific condition. The differentials for LRP are listed here. It is not an all inclusive list. In terms of the management of lymphomatoid papulosis, the current options present are often unsatisfactory and not definitive. Since a curative therapy is not available and none of the available treatment modalities affect the natural course of disease, short-term benefits of active treatment should be balanced carefully against the potential side effects. Simple wound care should be performed to necrotic papules and ulcers. Topical therapies include topical corticosteroids. There is also phototherapy options, including narrowband UVB as well as UVA therapy. Low-dose methotrexate weekly treatment is also an option. There are other options also reported, including topical nitrogen mustard, cyclophosphamide, photodynamic therapy, dapsone, doxycycline, retinoids, imicromod, excision, or radiation therapy for non-resolving large lesions. Now we move on to the second half of this presentation, which focuses on primary cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma. Primary cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma is comprised of large cells with an anaplastic or pleomorphic or immunoblastic morphology and is characterized by the expression of CD30 plus antigen by the majority of tumor cells, that is, over greater than 75% of the cells. The patients should not have clinical evidence or history of mycosis fungoides. 
These lymphomas account for 12% of all cutaneous T-cell lymphomas. They can affect both sexes, all ages and all races, but tend to occur in adults. The male to female ratio is 3 to 1. The onset age is typically in the 60s. Most patients present with solitary or localized nodules or tumors, and sometimes papules, which develop ulceration. Multifocal lesions are present in about 20% of patients. The skin lesions may show partial or complete spontaneous regression, as in lymphomatoid papulosis. These lymphomas frequently relapse in the skin. There is a predilection for the head, neck, and extremity areas. Regional lymph node involvement is present in 10 to 15% of cases. Extracutaneous dissemination occurs in 10% of patients and mostly involves regional lymph nodes. The prognosis is usually favorable with a 10-year disease-related survival exceeding 80%. In terms of the workup of cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma, this involves a punch biopsy, T cell rearrangement studies, blood testing, including full blood count, blood film, flow cytometry, LDH, electrolytes, liver function testing, HIV and HDLV1, immunosuppression screening, lymph node and hepatosplenomegaly examination, imaging, including PET scan and CT scan, and consideration of bone marrow biopsy with a hematology team to exclude systemic anaplastic large cell lymphoma. In terms of the histological findings, this includes dense sheets of large CD30 plus cells. Nuclei have irregularly shaped horseshoe or kidney shaped. Anaplastic cells are often found, including round, oval, irregular nuclei, prominent eosinophilic nuclei, and abundant cytoplasm. The majority of the neoplastic cells should be characterized by CD30 positivity, greater than 75% of the time. There is a high mitotic index, and the markers EMA and ALK should be negative in cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma. If these markers are positive, it strongly suggests a diagnosis of systemic anaplastic large cell lymphoma. In terms of the immunophenotype and genetic phenotype of cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma, it is characterized by CD4 plus positive T cell phenotype. There is variable loss of CD2, CD5, and CD3. And as alluded to earlier, the CD30 plus must be expressed by the majority of neoplastic cells. Unlike systemic anaplastic large cell lymphoma, most cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphomas express CLA, which stands for cutaneous lymphocyte antigen, but do not express EMA, which is epithelial membrane antigen, or ALK, which is anaplastic lymphoma kinase. In terms of the genetics, the translocation 2,5, which is found predominantly in systemic anaplastic large cell lymphoma in children, is not present in the vast majority of the cutaneous form of this lymphoma. There is also a gene arrangement named DUSP22IRF4, that is spelled D-U-S-P-22-IRF4, which is found in 30% of cases. In terms of differential diagnoses, there is a long list of other dermatoses which can mimic the lesion seen in cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma. Some of these are listed here. And these include other forms of cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, cutaneous B-cell lymphoma, pityriasis lichenoides chronica, folliculitis, insect bites, histiocytoses, Dagos disease, drug eruptions, and papillonecrotic tuberculosis lesions. In terms of management options, radiotherapy and surgical excision are often considered as initial treatment options in patients presenting with solitary or few localized nodules or tumors. However, if a solitary lesion disappears spontaneously, no further therapy is often required. In patients presenting with multifocal skin lesions, this may be best treated with radiotherapy if there's only a few lesions, or else low-dose methotrexate, oral retinoids, or interferon alpha. For patients who present or develop extracutaneous disease, or those rare patients with a rapidly progressive disease, these should be treated with a doxorubicin-based multi-agent chemotherapy. There is also some evidence for the biologic CD30+, plus targeted by brentuximab as a potential option. So that summarizes our presentation focusing on lymphomatoid papulosis as well as cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma. I hope you found this presentation useful. We'll see you in the next one.